Hello, good morning. Welcome to the second day of the INL Battery Summit. Yesterday we had two sessions, the first on battery applications and the second on advanced materials and battery manufacturing. We had quite relevant discussions about how energy storage will support the European goal for having a carbon neutral continent until 2050. Uh, one common thought went through uh, all the panels, we must act now. So uh, with no further ado, we start this second day with the Director General of INL, the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory, from where this conference is being broadcasted. Professor Los Montelius, welcome. Thank you very much, George. Uh, very good, uh, nice welcome to all of you participating in today's event, and specifically to State Secretary Joe Galamba. We are looking forward to your intervention. And uh, I just would like to make a very kind of uh, summary of yesterday. I think yesterday's uh, sessions were extremely nice, very good. As you know, we had uh, uh, the, the Vice President uh, Maru Sevkovic, as well as the Commissioner Elisa Ferreira speaking with us about the European view and the necessity of actually getting our acts together and move forward together in a coherent way. And I think we the, the other sessions during the day, as George said, the battery applications and advanced materials and battery manufacturing brought very, very many important issues to the table. One particular is, of course, about the raw materials and the, the necessity of having access to the raw materials and the, let's say, the value chains with that. But another thing was also about the manufacturability and the necessity of setting up I would say the new modern tools or the new machinery that we need in order to uh, to have a competitive edge in in uh, in the worldwide landscape when it goes to the battery and the competitiveness that exists there. And then, of course, there was a nice introduction about the landscapes in in Portugal. And today we are going to forward with more insights about how the landscape is moving in the Iberian Peninsula. But there also more discussions about the raw materials for the circular economy, as well as the future of battery, battery and challenges. And there is, I think, besides the uh, besides the technical things that we were discussing to some at some depth yesterday, we also touched about this kind of more societal perspective and the inclusiveness in society in order to move this forward. And I think these are very important aspects and we are looking forward to hear more about that today, of course, but also that we are starting now, uh, I would say, uh, a transition. Uh, and if we do this together, we will have the possibility to have the success in the end that we like to have, to have a strong workforce being developed in the Iberian Peninsula and with many new, very interesting jobs and with a lot of positive energy being brought into this energy table, so to say. Um, for those of you that are new to INL, just a very few words about INL. INL is an intergovernmental research organization headquartered in Braga in Portugal. And we are hosting right now about 400 people from about 40 different countries working together in a coherent fashion. And of course, one of our major strengths besides the scientific knowledge and excellence and expertise and the investments being made in the building uh, with all the equipment that we have access to, is also our ability to orchestrate and to uh, to aggregate and to recruit different stakeholders in order to move forward in coherent fashion. And I think this is very important that there is an organization that can have trust in, in society, of course, but also that can move forward by bringing people together in a neutral base and then discuss how we together actually can make a difference. And that is all about the motivation and the kind of the answer to the question why, why and uh, why we actually exist. And I think it will be of important to remember that we can only succeed if we actually move together. So this is not about a single country or a single research or a single research group or a single university. It's all about moving together and we need to move together in a coherent fashion. So with these words, I leave the word back to you, George, and then you can start up the meeting. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Lars. Montel, used for your opening words and for the recap on the key takeouts of yesterday's sessions. As you know, from the opening session yesterday, the European and national commitment towards this topic is being made at the highest level. Uh, that is why today we have with us the Portuguese Deputy Minister and the Secretary of State of Energy, João Galamba. Welcome to the INL Battery Summit. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Thank you very much, George. Uh, I would like to say hi to Professor Lars Montelius, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by thanking. Sorry. Let me start by thanking the organization for the for this invitation and the opportunity to debate uh, such a relevant theme for the energy transition and uh, for the strategic autonomy of the European economy. It's time to take advantage of this moment to capitalize on all the relevant collective initiatives that Portugal has, such as the one that brings us together today in this event. The path to a carbon neutral economy requires joint action in several strategic areas, uh, with a priority being given to energy efficiency, a greater diversification of energy sources, increased electrification, reinforcement and modernization of infrastructure, market stability and investment, and reconfiguration and digitalization of energy markets, uh, as well as incentives for research and development, promotion of low carbon processes in general, new products, new services, with a more informed and aware consumer. Uh, with the trend towards electrification of the economy, the electric vehicle industry applications and its growing demand by consumers, the battery production value chain is increasingly playing a decisive role and uh, is critical to Europe's objectives and to Portugal's also. Consequently, it translates into the search for supply chains for the necessary strategic minerals, as well as research into new materials. The worldwide demand from lith for lithium used in the production of, uh, of batteries and plates used in the manufacture of uh, electrical appliances is increasing. And in this context, it should be noted that the European battery Alliance launched by the European Commission with major industrial stakeholders, EU member states and the European Investment Bank is essential for this objective. It is and has to be, um, as Lars mentioned before, a, um, a collaborative project led by the industry aimed at facilitating the emergence of integrated battery um, projects with the objective of creating in Europe a competitive production value chain with sustainable batteries at its core. This uh, aims to reduce the European Union's uh, dependence on other markets in this sector, making it autonomous and the leader in this type of production. Batteries are an important factor in the transition to climate neutrality, and we should emphasize that sustainable mining is a precondition for the clean battery value chain. In order to ensure mining and critical raw materials are compliant with the EU's uh, Green Deal and the EU climate goals, we reiterate the importance of further action on green certification of critical raw materials pertaining to batteries and energy storage. At the national level, uh, we are at the final stage of our review of our mining legislation, and uh, we aim to establish uh, solid green mining principles committed to setting standards for clean and competitive battery production. Portugal, with its clear and strong commitment to carbon neutrality, intends to contribute to defining a set of principles for a socially and environmentally sustainable mining sector in Europe and contribute to integrate these principles into other member states' raw material policies. With this approach, we will promote the production of use and use of high performance batteries and establish sustainability references in all value chains through a set of principles for a socially, uh, social mining sector and environmentally sustainable essential raw materials policies at the European level, but also by highly efficient recycling processes and technologies aiming at maximum recovery of batteries and its components to allow the reduction of EU's dependence on raw materials and a circular economy. In this context, we highlight the revised list of 30 raw, uh, critical raw materials revealed by the European Commission last September of 2020. That included lithium. This list reveals the raw materials with high importance to the EU economy, 
and of the risk associated with air supply, showing the growing concern of its access within the European Union. In fact, Portugal is recognized as one of the countries with reserves for an economically viable commercial exploration and in the Iberian Peninsula uh, with its mining resources and with a strong autom automotive industry, we can aim to be a relevant player in this area on, in the European context. Countries that have their own facilities to produce batteries and advanced technology can, take an, can make an important contribution to this field. Considering Portugal's potential, developing all value chain will be able to maximize the, the added value of the lithium mining process, combining prospecting and extraction with the capacity for refining raw materials. To trace added value for association with the transforming industry, valuing European and sustainable production. We have the competences in advanced raw materials, electrochemical energy storage, new generation solid state batteries, chemical processing of lithium compounds and waste management that can help to develop batteries, uh, uh, the, the, the strategic value chain that we all ambition. Hence the importance of mobilizing investment and resources in, in the opportunity for economic and to boost green recovery, in which Portugal is strongly committed. Avoiding the technological dependence of European competitors and capitalizing on the growth and investment potential of batteries implies that Europe move, uh, moves quickly on this global race. Therefore, Portugal embraces its role in the, in the battery value chain and will use its recovery and resilience program as an important financial leverage to kickstart um, uh, um, a sustainable battery ecosystem in Portugal and the Iberian Peninsula. The new energy model currently underway towards carbon neutrality represents a unique opportunity for countries which will make possible to transform the national economy in the logic of sustainable development based on a democratic and fair model which promotes civilizational project, uh, progress, technological advancement, job creation and prosperity, territorial cohesion together with the preservation of natural resources. This summit is of utmost importance for this reason, because we strongly believe, as uh, Lars said in his introduction, that either we do this collaboratively or we don't do it at all. And an institution uh, uh, such as INL and, um, and the Battery Cluster of Portugal being collaborative uh, uh, endeavors are the ideal um, starting points for such an activity in Portugal. So I wish all of you um, a great discussion in this second day and I reaffirm the, the utmost commitment of the Portuguese government not only to create the enabling uh, legal um, and regulatory conditions for such a value chain to kickstart but the necessary financial support as was mentioned yesterday by the uh, environmental minister we have the mobilizing agendas for reindustrialization. They are a key component, component to mobilize stakeholders, industry and research centers towards uh, particular challenges. And there is no bigger challenge than energy storage and batteries. So we believe that it's a great opportunity for the Portuguese industry, um, uh, startups, medium companies, larger companies, and for research centers such as INL and other research centers in Portugal that together uh, we can actually place Portugal and the Iberian Peninsula in this important field. Thank you very much and have a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy <laughs> Minister João Galamba, for highlighting the Portuguese government priorities in this field and also for the commitment that you brought to this conference regarding the high standards for securing that critical raw materials such as lithium will be extracted under a strict legal framework and according to the Green Deal rules, collaboration, as you said, is the name of the game. We will now uh, have an additional overview of the Iberian batteries landscape, the, this time from the Spanish side. The next speaker is the president of Battery Plat and uh, the head of innovation at EDP Spain. Welcome, Luis Santos Moro. Okay. Good morning and thank you for your introduction. Uh, I want to begin by showing our appreciation to the INL for giving us this uh, opportunity to share with you our ideas. Um, congratulations for, for this Battery Summit. I'm going to share with you a presentation. Uh, I think 
you will be watching it in a few moments. This how? Okay. Can you uh, see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's begin. Uh, well, at, at the beginning of February uh, this year, uh, the Spanish government uh, published the Spanish uh, energy storage strategy. Uh, this is a, a document with a set of 66 measures, including uh, measures about regulation, modifying uh, operating procedures, uh, fostering sector integration and eliminating uh, network tariffs double charging. Uh, there are other measures regarding new business models like the promotion of the, the role of independent aggregator, uh, foster domestic industry and boosting renewable energy communities. And there is a, a third set of measures regarding R&D to develop uh, prospective studies and to push collaboration among academia, industry and government. Um, and precisely in, in this set of R&D related measures, battery plus role is recognized as one of the main Spanish players fostering a common vision for the development of storage technologies. And what is Battery Plat? Well, Battery Plat is, is a technology platform. It's not an industry association. Our mission is to encourage the development of energy storage technologies to reach a level of technological maturity that makes them competitive. We have so far more than 70 members. They are members from academia, universities, uh, research and technology centers, like INL, which is a member of Battery Plat, and we also have industries, big industries, small industries, and startups. So it's, it's a mixed environment of agents in Spain fostering the development of energy storage technologies. And taking into account this landscape of different entities at European level, uh, we need to distinguish what is the scope and the approach of different entities regarding the tier scale. Uh, we have Battery 2030, which is focused on low levels of TRL, and we have the, the EVA uh, 250, which is a, a European battery alliance to, to develop uh, industry opportunities. But on the other side, we have Batteries Europe, which is a European, European technology and in innovation platform. So Battery Plat is to the Spanish ecosystem somehow equivalent to this Batteries uh, Europe technology and innovation platform. In fact, in fact, uh, some of the uh, members of Battery Plat entities are represented at this uh, Battery Europe te European Technology Platform. We have uh, one chair and two chairs, uh, Mr. Oscar Miguel Crespo, who we spoke uh, yesterday. We have the opportunity to uh, have it in, in this Battery Summit. Uh, his entity, City Tech, is a member of Battery Plat, and he is also the chair of one of the working groups in this Batteries Europe European uh, Technology. Uh, platform. And the, the structure of our uh, technology platform is uh, divided into three main uh, working groups. We have a working group for technologies, including all energy storage technologies. Uh, we have a, a markets uh, working group devoted to see where are the uh, opportunities and, and different business models. And we have a different uh, working group devoted to circular economy because there are many issues involving recycling, uh, reuse, uh, second life, and eco design that are very, very relevant in terms of energy storage technologies. And we have an approach that is uh, some kind of uh, agnostic approach in terms of energy storage technologies. The name Battery Plat is, is, is a bit appealing, it's, it's, it's quite a sexy name but we are not devoted only to electrochemical energy storage. We have a, a more global approach considering different families of energy storage, chemical energy storage, thermal energy storage, mechanical energy storage. We have this big stew of different technologies that aim to store energy in one way or another. And this shows in the in, in, in the number and, and, and the profile of the projects that members of the Battery Plat are developing. Uh, mostly there are projects uh, regarding electrochemical and restore it, namely batteries, but we also have uh, several projects involving chemical and restore it and thermal, hybrid system, mechanical and restore it, and even magnetic, what is uh, the, the less relevant uh, technology family in this in this technology tree. Uh, 
going deeper into the electrochemistry, uh, the majority of projects in, in, in the electrochemical uh, side of the, of the equation are devoted to lithium ion and beyond lithium, technologies that go beyond lithium. And we also have projects uh, involving redox flow batteries, or the capacitors, and other chemistries like zinc and, and lead. And if we talk about the capabilities that have been reported by the members of a battery plot, uh, this is uh, somehow parallel to uh, the profile of the projects because uh, most of the, of the capacities have been reported in, in the field of electrochemical uh, energy storage, being a chemical energy storage in, in, in second place. So if we go deeper in, in this uh, profile of capabilities, if we have a, a breakdown and we, if we consider the, the value chain of energy storage uh, from bottom to top, we see this profile of different capabilities and uh, the, the members of battery power of battery plant are very strong at component manufacturing and system integration. This is the, the general profile of capabilities of our members. But if we divide, if we go deeper and analyze this profile of capabilities, considering the specific profile of the agent, what we see is that uh, members at, in, in the, at the academia level, at the academia level, have a different profile of capabilities. Uh, there are a lot of uh, members from academia that report capabilities in component manufacturing and system integration goes next. But here we can identify uh, some gaps. Uh, we identify that we don't have uh, members of battery plot uh, at the academia level reporting capabilities at operation and maintenance and at raw materials. Uh, if we uh, consider uh, the, the breakdown of capabilities in the industry level, the picture is quite different. Here, the majority of uh, entities that are reporting capabilities are in system integration. Um, there is a, a lot of in, uh, entities that are also reporting capabilities as the, at the commissioning, reuse and recycling. So that, is, that shows that there is uh, industry opportunities and there is uh, money on the table about this uh, reuse and recycling of, of batteries and also ancillary system manufacturing. And the gaps here are in the main subsystem manufacturing uh, and in the raw materials uh, and the raw materials uh, side of the, of the equation. So uh, this is the situation <clears throat> so far uh, regarding the capabilities of the, of the members uh, in battery plant today. Uh, we would like to increase uh, the number of, of members so that we can uh, tackle uh, all these gaps and to uh, uh, well, to, to foster the development of technologies and to help uh, all members of this uh, technology platform to find opportunities to develop technologies and to carry out uh, projects and to cooperate in order to uh, increase the maturity level of different and historic technologies. Well, so, so finally, that is the main conclusion. So the, the, the Spanish energy storage strategy acknowledges the role of battery plant in, in Spain. Uh, battery plant members are represented at European level. Uh, lithium ion and beyond lithium account for most of the, of the projects developed by members. Uh, capabilities at academia level and industry level are quite different. The profiles of capabilities are quite different. And so far, and so far several gaps are, have been identified in terms of capabilities. So we encourage uh, new members to help us to fill these gaps and to create opportunities for the whole ecosystem in Spain. And that's all. I'm very approachable to, to you at Patrick Platt and also at my email address at ATP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis Santos Moro, for bringing us the current state of the art in Spain regarding the collaboration efforts to make batteries an important part of the energy transformation that the Iberian Peninsula and Europe need. We now head into session three and the first one of this second day to discuss raw materials for the circular economy covering green mining, sustainable processing and also recycling and recovery. To moderate this panel, this panel the uh, senior advisor for exploration and resource assessment at EIT Raw Materials, welcome Patrick Nettle. 
Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Thank you, George, for introducing me. Uh, yes, I'm the Senior Advisor for Resource Assessment and Exploration at EIT Raw Materials, and I would like to wish you all uh, a good morning and a welcome to this session on the circular economy and raw materials that are needed to drive this process and this activity. Uh, now, to set the scene and to, to let me briefly introduce this topic, uh, a lot of it has already been uh, discussed in the first day. Unfortunately, I couldn't join the discussions, but uh, what I'm hearing is a lot of it has already been discussed. Uh, so we're going to dive deeper into this topic, but to just to give you a uh, set the scene for you. In 2015, the European Commission adopted its Circular Economy Action Plan and acknowledged that the transition from a linear to a circular economy uh, from responsible mining to resource efficient processing to recycling is an essential contribution to the EU's effort to develop a sustainable, low carbon and resource efficiency and competitive economy. This kind of summarizes the, the whole concept of circular economy and, and obviously uh, raw materials play a pivotal role in all of this coming from uh, di the digital transformation, the transformation to e-mobility and the low carbon uh, challenge that we're facing as well. So before we dive into the questions, let me welcome and introduce the panelists for today's discussion on raw materials for the circular economy. We have yeah, uh, six, six panelists with us today and uh, just about 35 minutes to get through the session. So uh, may I remind the panelists right at the get go uh, to keep their answers short and sweet. To introduce the panelists we have with us today, uh, David Archer. David is the CEO and Director of Savannah Resources, a company developing Europe's largest spodumene lithium deposit in Portugal. Uh, David has a large background, uh, has, sorry, has a law background <laughs> and has over 30 years of experience in the mining and international resources industry, serving in countless executive roles. We have uh, Miguel Faria. Miguel is a technology project coordinator at Luso Recursos. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, <laughs> a company exploring raw materials needs for economic and technological innovation in sustainable development, specifically the prospection, extraction, transformation of raw materials that have technical value for the production of high quality lithium ion batteries. We have uh, Carlos Nuguera. Carlos is a senior scientist and the coordinator for materials for energy at LNEG, the uh, Laboratorio de Energia, the largest public sector R&D institution in Portugal. We have John Asin. John is the CEO and co-founder of B Planet Factory, a, a company focusing on the urgent need to support the implementation of electric mobility to achieve an emission-free future. We have Paulo Alves with us today as well. He is the founder and general manager slash CEO at EDM Tech. EDM stands for Electronics, Design and Mechanics. And his company explores the added value found at the intersection between various technological disciplines. Last but not least, we have Pedro Nazareth. Pedro is the CEO of Electrao, a Portuguese producer organization responsible for waste streams from electric and electronic equipment, industrial and portable batteries, and packaging. As you can see, our panel, uh, our panel's expertise covers almost all aspects of the raw materials supply chain in the context of circularity. And I don't know if you noticed, but I tried to introduce the panelists in a supply chain order, more or less, from sourcing to design, manufacturing to reuse and recycling. And to kick things off and to get the discussion going, I would like to ask all of you on this panel, the first question I would like to start uh, with David Archer here. The first question for this panel, where are we on the way from linear to circular? Are all building blocks in terms of raw materials in place or are there still significant technical, social or legislative obstacles to overcome? David, would you like to start on this? Um, Thanks, Patrick. And um, yeah, um, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a terrific, uh, I think it's a terrific uh, question. And um, um, I think, I think there's, you know, sort of broad uh, industrial uh, buy-in uh, around the, the concept of uh, the circular economy um, for the very practical reason that 
um, I think it's very good business uh, these days. Uh, I mean, I think it's just a, a compulsory element, um, particularly for um, businesses in, in Europe. But I think probably the, the major challenge, I think, is um, to, to get uh, societal buy-in on the concept. Um, I think the concept of a, a circular economy is um, are two words that are probably not broadly understood by uh, sort of popu uh, by populations and citizenry. And um, I think really a lot of work needs to be done to explain what it all means, what the benefits are uh, for uh, for uh, populations and uh, and communities. And um, you know I think there has been really a tendency, I think, for um, citizenry to, if you like, sort of cherry pick um, the elements in the in the value chain that they do like, for example, uh, sort of consumption uh, of EVs or mo mobile mobile phones uh, to sort of opt in, uh, opt into that, but opt out of uh, the responsibility of uh, producing the raw materials. Um, so I think there really needs to be a lot of work done on um, really sort of bringing uh, sort of, uh, communities together and uh, a cohesive, um, cohesive sort of support um, uh, to uh, around the uh, the idea of the um, the circular economy. And I think um, the European Commission really has to look at um, investing. Uh, you know, significant sums in terms of um, introducing this concept and um, and marketing it and um, developing understanding and knowledge and appreciation and commitment uh, to the circular economy. Thank you, David. Uh, very good points that you raised there. Uh, societal buy-in, obviously a big topic and investments as well. Uh, I'm sure we will come back to those two points. Uh, Miguel, would you like to continue? Uh, we would like to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, uh, so uh, one of the concepts and policies of use of recursos is effectively the circular economy uh, in the genesis of the value chain uh, of the new lithium iron batteries. Uh, a circular economy is evident and uh, for an energy, energy transition. Uh, this value chain implies new players uh, and technologies uh, leveraged by new companies, new ways of being in society, in, and in, in economy, like uh, David uh, mentioned. Uh, Luz of course identifies in Minerva Human project uh, endogenous and exogenous factors uh, that influence uh, four economies, global, global, sectional, uh, local, and internally in the company, creating six cycles, or, or uh, uh, extraction, transformation, lithium batteries, ceramics, water, carbon dioxide, and energy. Uh, this paradigm uh, shift uh, will contribute to a more balanced uh, dynamic between society, consumers and natural resources, uh, making it uh, necessary to adapt instruments to this reality in terms of social, environmental and economic responsibility. Uh, in the value chain of lithium iron batteries, uh, loss of recursos uh, position at the beginning and end of the transformation cycle, uh, more precisely, uh, the refinery is being developed to receive primary raw material extract and also uh, lithium hydroxide recovered from used batteries, which will be integrated in the process again. Thus, uh, the, this technological process inherent to the refinery are the link or the connection for a cycle integrated in, in the battery value chain. And uh, I think it's important to, to, to construct a new, a new uh, value chain uh, in the batteries, uh, in the in the battery purpose. Thank you, thank you, Miguel. Uh, I see uh, John, you raising your hand there. Let me just go through all the speakers first, uh, and in a linear order, and then we can go circular and uh, open up the discussion. Uh, so, Carlos Noguera, uh, we would like to hear from you as well. Where are we on the way from linear to circular? Well, thank you, uh, and I thank uh, firstly to INL for the invitation. Or, for being in this uh, summit, uh, I expect the pleasure. So about your question, where are we uh, uh, on the way from linear to circular? Uh, I think the implementation of circular economy is making its way, uh, but of course is a difficult and complex task. I, I think uh, socially speaking, the acceptance of uh, circular economy is good. Uh, the main problems are technical and, and economic. Uh, specifically in the case of batteries, um, circular, 
circular economy means to design and to build the products to last. Uh, that means making products with good performance materials um, and uh, very accurate and precise assembly is costly and, uh, and the products uh, shall be used for the, the major population, they shall be accessible. So uh, good quality uh, products at affordable prices um, require a lot of work, require research, uh, require uh, application of smart manufacturing processes and, uh, and to decrease the manufacturing costs. So it is a difficult task. Um, another aspect is the design for, uh, for disassembling. Uh, uh, the case of the electric vehicles uh, can be, can be uh, referred in, in this specific situation. The, the needs for space and cost optimization uh, in, in a vehicle design um, and manufacture and assembly are usually contradictory with the needs for an easy disassembly and uh, usually the latter being normally disregarded. That means the manufacturers make attention for uh, efficient and optimize, optimization of assembling and not so much to the disassembling. That means that uh, um, uh, this, this uh, turns the, the, the dismantling for recycling difficult. The wide range uh, of battery pack uh, shapes and designs among different manufacturers also contributes to the, the complexity of the processes hindering the efforts for mechanization and automation. But of course, this is um, a long, a long work uh, ahead, and of course we need to to optimize and to to develop better solutions. Just a detail about the, the legislation and regulation. We know that the circular economy action plan of March 2020 states that proposal for a new uh, regulatory framework for batteries will consider rules for recycling content and measures to improve collection and recycling. And you know now that the new uh, regulation on batteries is now under discussion, the draft version. And just details on this regulation. It foresees the need for a minimum recycled metals, lithium, cobalt and nickel, uh, for, build, uh, for building a new industrial or a new electric vehicle battery. Uh, I have here some numbers. Um, in 2030, it is foreseen the content of recycled metals from 4 to 12 percent, and in 2035, from 10 to 20 percent. That means this new regulation um, uh, can improve the recycling of some metals uh, in the batteries because there is a need for uh, inclusion of uh, recycling metals in the manufacture of a new battery. Uh, this new regulation also defines rules for electrochemical performance on durability, which is also a very uh, interesting point, as well as safety and labeling. So, um, it is a path to, to improve the, the circularity and I think the, 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 we must continue trying to, to optimize all these flows and uh, in order to have a better circularity. Thank Very you. important point there, Carlos. Yeah, the yeah, optimization for recycling and that's probably something we will come back to as well if there's time. Uh, John, uh, Asin, uh, do you have uh, something to add to add has what has been said? <laughs> Yeah, very, <clears throat> very briefly, uh, Patrick. Okay, as, as you are, uh, um, <clears throat> what we are doing is we we sell second life batteries, okay, and we are facing that everybody loves the idea of reuse batteries, but at the end of the day, you need to be very, very economic because the end customer wants a very, very economic solution, even uh, that they cost less than half of a new battery. And not only that. The, you need to have their confidence because they think, hey, this is a used battery, maybe it's not going to last. Okay, so these are barriers that we are facing in the market. In fact, <clears throat> we are not having any kind of reward from from the public authorities or whatever to to recycle, to reuse these batteries. And moreover, sometimes recycled, reused batteries are excluded from public uh, uh, aid programs. For example, for solar photovoltaic. So we are competing against new batteries, which are uh, which can be object of a uh, public aid. So this is at the, at the moment a very tough situation, and so the the customer mentality must change so that they understand that uh, reusing a product is, is good. 
and, and also that we have the same consideration as new batteries. I mean, what we do now, uh, just for the obligation, let's say, we need to, to pay uh, every time we sell a battery, but we don't have the same advantages. Ideally, we need to reach a situation similar to the paper, you know, the recycled paper, everybody thinks it's a good idea, and everybody is willing to pay more or less as much as, as for new paper. Okay, but it's not the case now with uh, reused batteries. It's a, it's a very good point, uh, and we still, uh, at this point, still have a long way to go, but I th are we on the right path? Paolo, uh, may I ask you that question uh, in the context of going from linear to circular with raw materials in mind, obviously? Yes, um, I think um, uh, uh, for the circular economy, uh, it must be started on the, the battery pack producers. We must think uh, to develop uh, batteries that is more easy to disassemble, uh, some pattern on the disassembling for more easy disassembling for use and recycling, because for uh, reduce our costs on the, dis the disassembly the batteries for recycling. I think uh, is um, in this moment technology is more or less available for um, do the, the work, but uh, we need some help from the the, the state for start uh, do the better the process the process. And so uh, I think the, the producers, the big producers, must be have some legislation for help for. Um, do some patterns on the batteries for easily uh, reuse and uh, recycling. Yeah, I'm. Um, yeah, uh, good to hear you emphasize this point. I think it is very important. Uh, and before we go into a broader discussion, I would like you to use the raise hand symbol to keep it uh, in an orderly fashion. I would like to give the word to Pedro. Uh, yeah. Good morning. Um, well, uh, Patrick, uh, maybe to um, to answer your question, I would uh, uh, answers. I would offer you a, a broader perspective about um, on uh, on where where are we on the way to the linear to circular economy? Huh? Uh, because if we narrow down um, the question to the reality of the numbers, uh, none of us would be really happy with the response uh, because. Research being done consistently uh, on the topic, uh, on the circularity of the usage of, 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 of the world's economy resources, retrieve figures around 9%. Staggering figures, I would say. Um, and and I, I derived this figure from the last circularity report 2020, which actually it is a, a remarkable uh, think piece work that offers this figure of 9%, meaning that uh, 100, about 100 uh, gigatons of the materials that have entered the world's economy, uh, only nine gigatons were from recycled sources. And so this is the, let's say, the, 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 the straightforward answer to the question, uh, and, and which, is, which is to say that uh, humans meet their yearly uh, consumption needs by extracting minerals, biomass and ores that amount up to 92 gigatons of materials from the Earth crust. So, and this report is very straightforward in answering the, your question. Uh, uh, and I would highlight two other uh, important aspects that I think uh, uh, would give room for discussion. One of the aspects is that, um, and that come out of this report, is that even if we made possible to recycle all the waste materials available with 100% efficiency, I would say, we would only meet about one third of the material consumption needs. And this is clearly showing how unsustainable our consumption needs are and the linearity of the supply chain business models uh, in which we rely upon. And the second uh, aspect that I would like to, to highlight and that comes, also comes out of this report is that we are continuously net adding uh, a very significant stock of materials embodied in products and infrastructure to the economy. And, um, and so, and therefore, Recycling systems will have to prepare for increased responsibility in terms of competence, in terms of capacity, in closing the loops and securing the treatment of all of these materials. So these are the figures 
uh, uh, and this is the answer I'd like to offer to your question. Yeah, very good, Pedro. And and to diplomatically summarize uh, your intervention here, I think the numbers are saying we can do much better. Uh, and to summarize the, the first round here of uh, our panelists' answer, I, uh, yeah, just to give you an overview, I think very important points have been raised. Societal buy-in is important, the opt-in, opt-out. Uh, process, new technologies and resource efficiency obviously are uh, high on the agenda as well. Uh, generally, uh, there, there seems to be a discrepancy maybe. Uh, is there a good accept acceptance uh, or isn't there a good acceptance? And also the optimization for recycling here. Uh, would any one of you comment on the other panelists' uh, answers? If not, I have a very nice bunch of questions lined up for you here. Uh, we can maybe go ahead with the next question. I would like you to use the raise your hands symbol. That would be good. Uh, so the reduction, and that actually goes back to many of the points that were raised, uh, this question here, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and more circular products are desirable from a societal point of view, but investing in these issues is, is timely and expensive for upstream industries and costly for companies and downstream sectors. So do companies actually along the entire value chain from mining to end product and recycling lack currently the incentives uh, to make these kind of investments and what needs to change? Anyone? Miguel? Yeah. Uh... In that point, uh, it, it is important that uh, the corporations be responsible to inventory and communicate uh, an ecological footprint for the entire value chain, uh, from the extraction to the final product. Uh, normally, and I uh, will like to underline normally, the new consumer opts for a product environmentally friendly. Uh, more important than move to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, is the investment in the retention of uh, carbon dioxide to produce oxygen. And for that reason, the strategy is not based on a greenwashing logic, but on a balance between the, the two plates uh, in the use and valorization of natural resources. Uh, in this way, uh, of course, uh, contributes to a low ecological footprint and has the responsibility to balance uh, greenhouse gas emissions in carbon dioxide cycle. Uh, this contribution in addiction to, to investments uh, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the activity involves uh, fi financial compensation uh, to, to projects for the protection of uh, biodiversity and the biomass uh, production, thus uh, transforming into a, an environmental uh, cost opportunity. And I think uh, that's the, the point that I want to focus here, that uh, we need to reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions, but we need to also uh, pro product, uh, produce uh, oxygen and balance the, the two plates of, uh, of these, uh, these, uh, these emissions. Absolutely. Um, David, you raised your hand as well. Yeah, um, just on um, on um, CO2 emissions, you know, I, I believe in the case of our company and um, you know, virtually every uh, company in the mining sector, um, really it's part of our societal compact, if you like, to, to look at um, every measure that we can introduce to uh, reduce our, our CO2 footprint. A lot of that in our case can be achieved by using um, power sourced from renewable sources in Portugal. There are very extensive hydro and wind resources in Portugal. So the actual processing of our raw material is something that can be done uh, quite effectively uh, from a CO2 uh, reduction point of view. What we can't really deal with at the moment is um, um, how we sort of reduce uh, emissions from uh, the mobile equipment uh, that we use for mining. Unfortunately, um, the mining equipment suppliers um, really haven't got to the point where uh, they've been able to successfully apply uh, batteries to uh, sort of heavy vehicles. So uh, we're reaching out to uh, some of the heavy vehicle manufacturers at the, mo at the moment, you know, the yellow goods people, uh, to sort of see you know, what initiatives they're working on and uh, to sort of see how we can 
uh, layer that in um, into our operations in uh, in coming years. So it's a um, it's a continuing challenge, but um, you know one that uh, we will apply ourselves um, really rigorously to. Yeah, it's great. It's great to hear that. I I hope we have time uh, uh, for a few more answers here. Uh, Pedro, you raised your hand as well. Well, um, Patrick, just in the CO2 side of your question, also in relating to waste management systems or recycling systems. Well, I think the novelty of circular economy concept is in the in the recognition that recycling systems need to be perfectioned, need to be more ambitious in terms of targets and performance, but also in that these systems will not be enough to match our consumption pattern demand. And this is why topics such as sustainable consumption, waste prevention, lifetime extension of products or changing business models are addressed and make circular economy a unique concept different from previous ones such as green economy or eco-efficiency or sustainability, which we've heard of along the way uh, from where to where we are now. But becoming more efficient in managing uh, um, materials in the economy key, either by extending the lifetime of products when it makes sense of course or by recycling more and more easily these materials and their embodied carbon will allow us to dispose the materials we don't want to continue in the economic economic system the pollutants if i may say and and, and to close the material loops while reducing greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions and so uh, waste management uh, strategy or if you want um, um, resource usage and reducing greenhouse gases as environmental protection strategies are very well aligned if you if, I, if you say yeah uh, very good very good point and uh, Carlos and then uh, John uh, okay um, uh, uh, regarding your question you refer the costs and the, the, the need for the investments uh, by the companies I, I, I had costs and risks um, and um, you know that mineral processes and, um, and, and metallurgical and recycling processes are by definition, let's say, heavy industries requiring high investments and relevant uh, uh, operating costs. Uh, they are also require highly skilled professionals, so uh, investments in these fields are always uh, demanding and risky. And regarding the risks, um, uh, I, I can give an example of the, the composition of the batteries and in the, in the particular case of lithium ion batteries. You know that the, the, the change in cathode chemistry, namely in the cathodes of lithium ion batteries, constitutes a permanent risk uh, for, the, uh, for the recycling uh, companies uh, and for also raw materials extraction. Uh, for instance, the decrease in cobalt usage in cathodes gives less interest for the recyclers to treat the, the black mass, that means the, 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 the powder materials after the previous uh, separation processes, because cobalt is undoubtedly the most valuable metal of the batteries. Uh, or uh, another example, how a, a, a mining company, a nickel mining or metallurgical company, manage the future of its business when Today, the NCM lithium batteries have growing amounts of nickel, so it's very good for a company uh, dealing with nickel, but uh, there are already news that the LFP batteries, that means the batteries with lithium, iron and phosphate, without any nickel or any cobalt, will be the most popular batteries in the near future. So, it is an uncertain future. For recyclers and for metallurgy, primary metallurgists, it is, or, uh, it is a risky business. Uh, so, uh, I, I can recommend that the process to be as versatile as possible, namely for the secondary production, in order to, to face the, the constant variations of the battery chemistries. Uh, regarding lithium, nowadays there is no such problem because all types of the lithium ion batteries chemistry have lithium. So, I think in the case of lithium, we have a, a more stable situation. <clears throat> Carlos, thank you very much. Uh, and, and and John, and my apologies. Uh, this is a really interesting discussion here, but we have a limited amount of time and I would really like to drill down on some of those aspects. But John, please, uh, I think we have, think time, we have for time for one more intervention. Yeah, I know I'll be very brief. Okay, uh, only that if we want to make a circular economy really happen is uh, you, you need to take the example with electric vehicles. Okay, nothing happened really with electric vehicles until 
there were penalties if you don't produce and sell enough electric vehicles. So basically, we are all here very highly educated people and we can make complex decisions, but the end consumer is just looking for the price at the end. So you need to, to, to prime this in the market somehow, either with uh, penalties for the, for the dirty solutions or with uh, tax exemptions for the clean solutions. But at the end of the day, is uh, basically uh, driving the market through um, through public um, uh, rules. No, very good points, and I, I think the narrative is always important. And obviously, complex problems like uh, the path from linear to circular economy uh, really requires a, a collective solution. And that therein lies the, the the real difficulty because you have those discussions with different stakeholders, as we have in this room. Uh, I believe there there are questions uh, from externals. I think George, can you intervene here? Um, I think unless we have time for for one more question here. Patrick. Okay. Uh, very good. So that that leaves us. Uh, Uh, I take it you can all see the question on the screen there now. So uh, we hear a lot about green mining with promises that critical raw materials such as lithium will be extracted in full respect for the environment and the local communities. But the image we have in our minds is the environmental disasters in China and other locations where lithium mining has a very bad reputation. Can you guarantee it will not happen here? And this is for Savannah Resources and Lucero Gursos. Uh, David, would you like to? Yeah, this? well, certainly. Yeah, certainly. Um, it front and centre, uh, the environmental footprint and the environmental impacts of our project are, are uh, sort of key uh, key issues, both for uh, the community and um, and and ourselves. And um, we certainly uh, have designed a project that uh, we believe um, either uh, eliminates or uh, impacts or reduces uh, them to the point uh, where they're no longer uh, no longer meaningful. And of course, yeah, it's a very sort of strict uh, sort of regulatory environment uh, broadly in Europe and, and specifically in in Portugal and I know that there's um, you know e extreme um, interest in um, ensuring that um, you know the best sustainable and responsible outcomes um, are achieved uh, from from mining in in Portugal so completely different context uh, completely different legislative regime and um, and some uh, very responsible groups looking to um, to um, to develop uh, Portugal's mineral endowment for the benefit um, of all of its citizens. Mm. Very good, David. Uh, Miguel, um, the question goes to you as well. Yeah, uh, like uh, David uh, uh, mentioned, it's uh, quite different the, uh, for the for these times that uh, regulation and legislation is quite. Uh, different from other countries such the the africa countries and other uh, other uh, countries in the world and i think in portugal we are trying to to move to to do a sustainable project with a, a minimum of impact uh, in society in environment and and so on and i think uh, uh, both projects are trying to to development uh, measures to 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 reduce the gas emissions and reduce the, the impacts and we are uh, we are in the way to to move uh, a sustainable project in uh, in lithium extraction i i find this this question actually uh, quite interesting because it it really comes back to a the narrative uh and there, there seems to be still a disconnect uh, between what uh, certain industry players are doing, uh, the public and the wider public and other stakeholders. So, um, do you think that the sustainable uh, mining processing, uh, the path toward a more circular economy, including recycling and reuse and reduce, uh, can be a European trademark that we really should develop uh, as quickly as possible? 
and can can uh, raw materials and and specifically obviously the sector in Portugal play a major role in this? Who would like yeah, to? Yeah, um, Patrick, I, I think that's uh, I think that's definitely the case. Um, you know, I believe that um, European sourced uh, raw materials uh, will be regarded as a as a premium uh, premium product. Um, you know, both because um, we will uh, be sort of producing those materials um, with a you know, design sort of lower uh, carbon footprint. And in comparison to raw material source from elsewhere in the world, um, you know where uh, you know there are you know, fundamental problems. Um, they're inferior to non-existent uh, labour laws in those countries. Um, they're uh, uh, sort of limited to minimal um, environmental laws, and there are serious governmental um, and uh, and governance sort of challenges. So, um, you know, I believe you know people like uh, the European car manufacturers will sort of preferentially uh, look to sort of source um, their upstream raw material uh, inputs from from European sources. So. Uh, Lusa Recruces uh, product and our own product, I, I believe, will be seen as a premium product and will sort of play to the um, overall sort of marketing imperatives that um, the, the downstream users uh, will require. Um, anyone else? Uh, Carlos, did you raise your hand there again? Uh, okay, yes. Um, I think uh, regarding the, the, the European resources and the, the, the extraction of primary and secondary raw materials, uh, I think the, in Europe and in Portugal, uh, uh, we should go by both roads. That means we shall, uh, we shall uh, uh, first to search for mineral resources and doing our best to their recovery and maximizing the added value inside Europe. Um, and secondly, to promote the circular economy by better design products for the recycling and by applying uh, highly efficient uh, recycling uh, process to to make the, uh, the the recovery of all the elements materials uh, as much as possible. So it is so difficult to assess to, uh, to raw materials in Europe. Um, okay, I think. Uh, Europe had some delay in facing the problem of raw materials uh, as compared with other regions like Asia or America. But uh, also uh, Europe does not have all the, the primary resources that needs. It's not the case of lithium because you know that we have some uh, lithium resources, but regarding other metals, we have in Europe some difficulties because you don't have uh, the resources in, uh, in our territories. Uh, regarding recycling, it is uh, somehow surprising how low are the recycling rates nowadays from some important metals like red herbs and even like li lithium. Um, other metals have better recycling rates like copper, like li nickel, like cobalt. Uh, but lithium is not recovered because the most of the process applied in recycling of batteries are of pyrometallurgical um, technology. That, that means lithium is lost in the slag. They are uh, targeted to nickel and to cobalt. By applying uh, the process like hydrometallurgical approaches, uh, lithium can be better recovered. And I think we shall, um, we shall go to, to a process for maximizing the recovery of materials in batteries. The same applies to graphite, which is uh, usually not recovered and it, it is also a critical raw material. And the electrolyte, it's also not targeted in most of the industrial process. So, must, a lot of work must be done in order to uh, improve the efficiency of recycling and trying to recycling all the elements, all the materials, all the substance as possible. Yeah, very good point. Um, Paolo, I, I want to put you on the spot here because you you have a background uh, with an understanding really, uh, you know, at the interface between engineering uh, and, and mechanics and different different aspects of this technological uh, view on things. Uh, wh where do you think uh, this comes in, and, and also how do you feel from your perspective uh, how we can, you know, better uh, communicate that? And and really, because I, this seems to be a critical issue here: the narrative, how we communicate things. It is so difficult and complex. So it's it's about that communication. Where where do you feel uh, we can improve here, or do you think it's we're on a good way? Um. I think we, we must uh, show to the, the people because the most of people think uh, in recycling with uh, uh, very polluting uh, industry, and um, we must test this this image for for the because 
it's it's better recycling and uh, um, start to, to greenering. And so we, and for is more sustainable for, for the, the world. We we, we can uh, recycle the batteries. And uh, in this moment, uh, the, the exponential increase of the EVs. Uh, we must start uh, preparing the future uh, because the world will not be able to uh, uh, remove all the materials from the from the from the world. The, but uh, I think we must prepare and sensibilize the, the people that is the reality, and we need to do this for for the, the better future. Um, I think uh, about the, the process uh, for uh, for a factory. We think do uh, in Portugal this year. Uh, we we do only the first stage of the separate the, the, the raw material from the, the batteries uh, because uh, I think the volume, the volume of the batteries used in Portugal in Spain it is not not so so high. And uh, I send uh, the materials for recycling for a big factory in Europe uh, for food. But um, I think um, the, I received some, some questions from people asking if it's not uh, um, very polluting for the environment in uh, uh, this area. And I, I show you that it's not, it's not, uh, it's not polluting. The first step on recycling is not polluting. And uh, I think um, the, we need some help to start the prevent the future now, because in three or four years, the development of the battery, uh, lithium batteries go for uh, of life is died. And, and, and so we must prepare um, the, the industry for reuse, recycling battery. Okay. Thank you. Paulo, um, uh, there is one more question here on the screen and maybe uh, David, I will pass it on to you in a second and then we have only a couple of minutes to, to wrap up really. So I would so like to ask all of you to, to yeah, give us your uh, final statement to this panel. Again, not enough time obviously to discuss this very complex subject in such a short time with, with such a great uh, but, but relatively big uh, panel. So, uh, uh, David, maybe if you can answer that question on the screen there. Yeah, sure. Um, we've been working uh, with the uh, regulator in uh, Portugal uh, since um, since early 2018. It's uh, to date, it's been a, a three-year process um, around the um, licensing of the expansion of our mining activities at, at Mina de Barroso. And I think what I can say is the um, you know we've been impressed with. Um, the methodical approach of the regulator. You know, it's clearly it's a very sort of rigorous process. Um, and uh, this will be the sort of the first major lithium mine in Europe. And um, it's certainly our intent to you know, really present um, and uh, and put into operation a, 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 a real example of um, you know, the, the best mining practices uh, employed, uh, employed globally. So um, we believe that um, what we've presented is a sort of comprehensive fact-based analysis of um, you know, what will be a, um, a uh, sort of shining beacon as to you know, how the mining industry can uh, best um, produce raw materials. Uh, very good. Exciting to hear. Uh, Miguel, Carlos, John, Paulo and Pedro, uh, any closing remarks from your side? Miguel? Yeah, I just join. First of all, good morning, everyone. Um, I mean, from 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 what we spoke um, uh, and from what we shared uh, through mail, I have no. no I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Miguel. Uh, um, I was referring I was to Miguel Saria. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think it's uh, important also to focus uh, that. Uh, uh, it's important to recycle and uh, the strategy of recycling is important, but uh, as Pedro Nazare mentioned uh, in the future, if we recycle 100%, uh, we will only get one third of the, the needs for the world. And uh, the predictions uh, is that we, we are facing a structural deficit, deficit uh, 
on the 2025 onwards and it's important also to, to extract raw materials and in our case uh, we will extract but we are also aiming to to use the the lithium hydroxide uh, to that uh, is recovered by recycling it's important to to think in a, in a cycle i i think is is that uh, th thank you, Miguel, and I'm, I'm afraid I have to wrap it up here. We're already running uh, over time here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure questions coming in from the audience will be able to uh, pass them on to, to you as well, to the panelists. Uh, thank you so much to all of you, uh, David Archer, Miguel Faria, Carlos Nuguera, John Nassin, Paulo Alves and Pedro Nazareth. It was a really interesting discussion. Again, obviously not enough time to comprehensively uh, tackle the subject, but uh, it's, it's important to make a start really. Uh, and that's what we've certainly done here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. Thank, thank you. you so much, Patrick Nettle and all the speakers who Pretty contributed too. for this panel about um, a critical step of the battery value chain, not only regarding the extraction of raw materials, but also the recycling and recovery. Time now to recharge our own batteries and grab a coffee. After a short break, we will be back for the last session of the INL Battery Summit. See you in just four minutes.
Welcome back to the INL Battery Summit. Uh, the um, coffee break was a little longer than we anticipated, so a larger coffee. Now uh, for session four, um, the last one of our conference, uh, we will debate the future of batteries, its challenges and opportunities. The panel is moderated by the thematic leader in energy storage at Inno Energy. We welcome Johan Soderbom. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, and finalize this conference with the, this session. And uh, uh, the, the name of the, the session is the future of batteries. Uh, and uh, uh, as the, the whole premises for, for this uh, conference is that the, there is, a, as you know, a tremendous development on the battery side during the last few years, actually, in Europe. And uh, just as an example of that, in, in 2017, there was one large-scale gigafactory project planned, European project planned in, 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 uh, in Europe today, uh, and that was Norfolk. Looking at the situation today, we know that there's plus 20 projects, gigafactory projects that is planned all across Europe in order to supply the batteries for, for the transition we are making in, in the, both on the uh, mobility side as well as on the, the transition in the electric, the energy system. And we, we get news of this all, uh, daily, I would say. Uh, last week, uh, Volkswagen had the power meet where there was really <laughs> Uh, revealed that even more uh, capacity was to be added to, to, the, uh, to the system in Europe, to the battery value chain in Europe. And as it looks now, we know that we by 2030, we will have uh, at least uh, 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 supply, uh, European supply for, for the demand we have on the mobility side in Europe. So these things are extremely interesting. It is really exciting. However, one of the prerequisites in order to be able to handle this is, of course, to have a strong research uh, institutes, institutions in Europe, as well as a, a research uh, community, a European research community that can actually uh, play into this, uh, this development that we have here. So one part of the discussion in this session would be to uh, examine that a little bit uh, and, and look at uh, uh, the research and innovation community and how that is supporting the future of batteries. Another big challenge we have uh, in order to, to pull this off that we have now started is, of course, to, to make sure that we have a skilled workforce that can uh, work in all parts of the value chain. And uh, uh, this is a, a huge challenge. Uh, uh, Fraunhofer recently uh, released a report saying that uh, there's an estimate of 800,000 people that's needed in order to, to, to make the transition in, in, the, in Europe uh, uh, when it comes to, to the uh, battery value chain. Oh, this, this challenge is, is enormous, both in sheer numbers of, of people that's needed but also the, the uh, need to identify what skill sets and, and who is going to train them. So, so that's something that is extremely uh, important as well. So I would like to spend also a part of this session in order to examine that part a little bit uh, as we do so. Uh, to do this, I have a very extinguished, <laughs> very, very not distinguished, I have a very honorable panel that will support me with this. And uh, I will make a very, very brief introduction because we have a lot of stuff to talk about. So I will not go through all of the deep parts of your bios, but I will introduce you here. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Christina Edström, who is uh, a professor of uh, inorganic chemistry at Uppsala University. And uh, she's been working with battery research for many, many years and, and been really uh, deep into this. She's also uh, director of the Large Scale European Research Initiative Battery 2030 Plus. So, so this is uh, so welcome. To speak. Uh, I also like to introduce Paolo Ferreira, uh, uh, who is uh, working at uh, INL, INL uh, where who is hosting this conference. And uh, uh, Paolo is head of the Advanced Electron Microscopy and Imaging, Imaging and Spectroscopy Center at the uh, here at the INL. 
So he's a group leader of atomic structure composition of materials. Uh, he's also a full professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IST, uh, University in Lisbon. So. Furthermore, we have Miguel Sanchez, uh, who is the Director General of Volkswagen Outdoor Europe, uh, so plant manager in, in Portugal, and chairman of the board of directors. Miguel Portela, uh, Associate Professor uh, at the University of Domino, uh, and he's uh, uh, currently a um, uh, professor with habilitation at the university. So. We also have uh, Helena Braga, who is uh, um, associate professor and head of the engineering physics department at the University of Porto. But she's also uh, working in the project Allbats, which is uh, very important in this context, since it's uh, uh, looking at the, the need for training skills uh, and, and uh, resources in order to, to pull off this transition that we're doing with the battery value. We have uh, my colleague, Frank Gielen, uh, who is Director of Education at the uh, EIT in Energy, uh, who's uh, been deeply involved in, in uh, the transition or, or reskilling and, and providing resources to do that uh, on a European basis. And finally, but absolutely not least, we have Susanna Quintana Plaza from GAL, who is a Chief op Operational Officer for New Businesses and Renewables at GAL. A uh, member of the board of directors, and, and uh, then as uh, uh, the title is uh, focused on on the response to renewables and new business and innovation. So, so welcome all of you, uh, and uh, thank you very much for for uh, joining this uh, session here today. So I would like to dive into the first topic then, which is focused on research and innovation. And uh, I would like to direct my first question here to Christina. And uh, as you're directing this uh, batteries 2030, 2030 plus, which is the, the big and European research initiative, initiative on this. So what are the real challenges that you have identified for, for looking at or inventing and, and, and developing the next generation of batteries? Europe. Thank you and thank you for this battery summit and join the discussions these two days. Uh, and I would like to start by saying that I have a number of points, but maybe my most important point is urgency. If we want more sustainable, more powerful batteries on our market, we need also to accelerate the research. And we need to accelerate the finding of new concepts and materials and how along the value chain, uh, I would say. And the transformation of the society is towards electrification and low, um, you know, the climate neutral approach, the Green Deal. So we need also, but it's also transformation to digitalization. And we are sort of lagging behind how we are uh, sort of combining materials research, the, uh, the, the development of the digitalizations, both at the research level and in our education. And I think that that is something that Battery 2030 Plus is trying to do. We are trying to do that and we have a long term perspective of doing that. We think it takes some time to build a platform, but we have to do it now and we have to do it rapidly. Another thing I would like to stress is actually that I'm a little bit worried that the uh, industrialization is going so uh, quickly now that there will be a gap between the academic research and industry research. And I think that is really problematic because that is something the academic people need to sort of catch up with, have good interaction with. The companies and the reason for that is that we are education educating the future skilled people and then we can't be too far separate in 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 our approaches at the same time i would like to stress that we need this really excellent inspiring research which might be a little bit esoteric and blue sky we must allow that too because that is inspiring for young people to enter the field and we want the best to enter the field 
and that's also important for keeping sort of Europe alive, I would say. And the reason why I engage in a large scale research initiative is that I'm sort of trying to see if we can do something pan European to avoid too much fragmentation if we are to actuate quickly and use these tools. So these are some of my points. Sorry, a bit mute there. Thank you very much, Christina. That was uh, uh, interesting. I'd like uh, uh, actually Miguel uh, Sanchez to comment a little bit on that uh, in just a, a second, but I would like to, to uh, uh, allow uh, uh, Paolo Pereira to, 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 to also answer a question here initially on, on this session, here, on this topic here. And, and uh, your institute, INL, uh, uh, has a focus on nanotechnology and uh, this is of course a very wide area but uh, can you comment a little bit and elaborate on how you uh, within your area is, is supporting the, the research uh, in, in the battery value chain? Uh, good morning everyone, uh, greetings to all. Um, yeah, regarding uh, your question, um, uh, I would say that given the size of the batteries that we uh, lead uh, on a daily basis, probably it's difficult to imagine that uh, our nanotechnology could have an impact in this area. But if you look around, uh, everything is made of these uh, basic ingredients of the universe, what we call atoms, that have actually uh, much smaller dimensions at the nanoscale. So to start with uh, the development and the, the performance of the batteries being the cathode, the anode, or the electrolyte is governed by mechanisms that operate at these very small scales. So a very important aspect that uh, uh, Christine already uh, talked about is that uh, to develop the new generation of batteries is, uh, is really fundamental uh, to understand these mechanisms. And these mechanisms, as I said, they work uh, they operate at these very small scales. That's uh, maybe the, I mean, the first point. The second point uh, uh, in terms of nanotechnology, uh, there is actually a couple of aspects. One uh, is the development of sensors, and the other one is uh, the advances in, uh, in materials. With respect to the sensors, I believe this is going to be a, a critical area that's going to be present across the value chain. Uh, we are talking about uh, development of sensors for uh, monitoring, for example, gases in uh, green mining and adjacent areas. Uh, this can be done by, uh, by nanomaterials, for example, reducing the environmental impact of uh, green mining also through, for example, monitoring water quality and, uh, and the soils, local soils. And also a very important aspect is the introduction of these sensors in battery cells. Here we have this cells, uh, these sensors that they are connected uh, digitally with some uh, capacity of uh, uh, auto uh, self-diagnosis. Uh, we are talking about temperature sensors, pressure um, and uh, gases, for example. And these are going to be very important because when we're managing the batteries, uh, we can uh, monitor in real time uh, this every single cell and so uh, make decisions which are important for these batteries. And in this case, uh, the nanotechnology is again very important because it is the glue in some way between the, the digital world and the physical world. Uh, this uh, communication happens at these scales. And then of course, uh, the materials development, uh, again for the, uh, these, uh, the, the green mining and the, the battery cells, uh, for example, the development of anodes, and as well as the recycling part, uh, where we need to recover uh, raw materials like lithium and copper and nickel and cobalt, uh, the use of nanotechnologies is going to be uh, extremely important. Thank you very much, Paul, Paolo. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with you on the sensor part there. So I, I, I would like to, 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 to pass a little bit of this question to, to Miguel here. From, uh, if you look at it from, from a... Uh, Volkswagen perspective, being in the big transition as you are right now, uh, and um, uh, specifically on the, on the battery side, and 
Well, how do you look at this uh, when it comes to European research and innovation environments in order to be able to, to support you in the transition you, 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 are, you are into right now? So first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this summit. Um, I mean, it, it's known that Volkswagen is highly committed with the decarbonization and therefore uh, increasing quite significantly in a short term um, its electric portfolio. Um, and of course, um, R&D plays a big role uh, in this because um, batteries are co competence. Uh, as core competence, um, I mean batteries are one of the major, if not the major uh, factor for product differentiation in the short term. Of course, digitalization and connectivity are also uh, important, but, but uh, batteries as far as the autonomy, the charging capability, but also size and, and, and weight, because size and weight affects, of course, and there's a big influence on the performance of the product of the car. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, uh, known uh, to be uh, um, a very interesting field, uh, uh, which is uh, developing quite fast and developed quite fast in the past as well. I mean, just take a look at, at um, the, the, the advancements in, in, the, in battery technology to achieve uh, um, uh, what we have now in our smartphones and, and therefore uh, research and development plays a big role in terms of the um, uh, uh, how, how fast uh, and uh, how differentiate the product of each OEM uh, uh, will be. Yeah. So in, in this context, of course, um, skills as physics, chemistry are very important. Um, partnership with R&D institutes and, and with uh, experts in this area are very important um, as uh, um, as well as others such as uh, um, mechanics, the more traditional skills as mechanics, electronics, and 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 um, and systems engineering, and IT engineering, um, in order to make our products um, differentiated to to the others. The the market is as competitive as it was never in in the past, and and therefore it plays a big role. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, just a quick follow up question on that, and. Uh, um, um, uh, if you look at, at the, the uh, support in research and, and innovation that you have from European uh, players, uh, uh, from, from a, a Volkswagen perspective, since you are active all across the, the, the globe, do you feel that, that uh, Europe is, is keeping up here? That's a question I'm not able to answer at this point in time, um, okay. as a production facility. Uh, I'll carry on and then I would like to direct sort of the same question to Susanna. Uh, you're also a, a company that's in transition uh, from uh, uh, from being a classical oil and gas company and looking at new mm. opportunities then, and new businesses. Uh, how, how do you see uh, the, the, the research community in, in, uh, in Europe? How, how, what's the support that you expect from that side? So? Susanna, I think you're on mute. I was. Thank you. <laughs> I was saying thank you for the invitation, Brian Ella. Thank you for your question. I, I think I would like to give it a little bit of a different spin to, to this question. Uh, why? Because um, I think we've been focusing a lot into, into the skills required for R&D on the cathode and the anode. And I think it's very important to say that the innovation and the new skills need to apply to the full battery value chain. A lot of conversation about the battery production. Um, you heard the previous uh, panelists talking about, uh, about mining, uh, so, so processing of the raw material, and we also need innovation along the, the full value chain. So while there's required training, and Joan, you said very clearly that we need around 800,000 people trained by 2025, for us it's very important several things. The first, the full battery value chain process of installation runs in parallel, not only in one part, okay, because otherwise there's not much purpose for, for the training. Uh, these people will have to find jobs somewhere else. Uh, second is that the concentration of knowledge and skills are not only directed to Central and Northern Europe. And I'm asking that not from a, just a cohesion uh, of Europe point of view, but we at Gulf truly believe that Portugal is better positioned than many other countries in Europe in order to have this fully integrated value, battery value chain. Why? We already had it in the previous 
uh, panel. Portugal has the best lithium mines in the whole entire world. And these lithium mines have the possibility to be the most sustainable mine with respect to sourcing from all other parts of the world. So how can we make these mines sustainable and economical at the same time will be critical, not only looking at cathodes and anodes. Portugal has an amazing logistical infrastructure, some of the best deep sea ports in Europe that will be critical in order to import materials and export finished goods. We have very good qualified labor here in Portugal and we are some of the leading countries in renewable energy. So the question to me is why are we concentrated so much in the central and northern Europe and we are not putting the skills and the resources for the full value chain here in southern Europe. Second, we need research and we need new skills, but we also have to take into account that, for example, Ralph already has many skills that are already critical for this battery value chain. So we have excellent heavy engineering skills required to make the facilities for processing. We know how to operate and execute these major projects. We know operations of refining and of recycling facilities. We are excellent at logistics, at handling very, very dangerous sometimes materials and moving them around the world. And at the same time in commercialization and sourcing the best materials locally and globally. So we need to look at the future of the technology, but we need to look at what we have today already and how can we make the best of what we have. So at Gulf, for the last 15 months, we have been spending a lot of time on investigating this opportunity. So since we saw the position of Portugal and the position of Gulf, in order to be able to create a fully value chain, we have dedicated a lot of resources. We have been talking to a lot of uh, miners around the world. I think you may have heard of a possible partnership with Mina de Barroso. We have been reaching out to global top uh, refining companies for lithium. We have been in continuous contact with cathode producers in order not to only take care of the mining, but to ensure that the full battery value chain is here, is here in Portugal. And we have started to hire international talent in order to educate the local workforce in order to be able to execute into, into our strategy. And last but not least, uh, we also have a very aggressive uh, renewable growth strategy for Iberia that will be critical in order to make this industry more sustainable than the type of batteries that we are getting from other parts of the, of the world today. That said, maybe Johan, for the question that you have for Miguel, um, how do we compare to the rest of you, uh, the rest of the world? I would say we're behind, and I will even say Portugal is especially behind. Uh, so I think that the, the commissioner yesterday, Elisa Ferreira, made a great comment that said that Portugal needs to catch up, and indeed we need to catch up. Um, that said, I think with the Gulf work that we have been doing so far, setting up thanks to the to the INL Institute, uh, the right public and private partnerships. I think that way we can start getting commitments similar to the ones that we have seen in France. Eight billion only for electrical vehicle production announced last year. Spain, as part of the recovery and resilience plan, announced this month 2.5 billion. Portugal is especially better positioned to capture this opportunity and we need to create these private and public partnerships in order to capture it. Of course, if we only capture the opportunities of today and we don't continue to develop the skills, the people, the, the, the research in order to continue in the future, we will fall behind in a few years. This is a very, very fast moving industry. So we need to do it all and we need to combine forces all of the different players here in Portugal and in the Iberia Peninsula to make this fully integrated battery value chain a reality. Because I, again, I will insist, I believe Portugal and Iberia is much better positioned than many other countries in Europe in order to capture this, this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, it sounds, uh, that sounds very encouraging uh, that we have that resource in, in, in Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, we we uh, have actually already moved in a little bit on on the on the uh, skills and education part here. So I, I would like to to continue a little bit on that end. And uh, uh, firstly, I would like to go to Helena Braga, uh, uh, since uh, your engagement in the All Bats project, where we actually are looking specifically at these questions and. Um, 
uh, where you're trying, uh, where you knew during the first year has has looked into this. So, uh, can you can you say something about the the status of, of what you have uh, uh, the conclusions you reached so far or the, the results you reached so far and uh, uh, what the, that means uh, for uh, the European battery value chain when it comes to skills and reskilling. And, uh, so first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure to be uh, again in INL, although not in, in body, but in wave. Um, and I would like to 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 say that Albats is a, is a, is a project from the European Union, and uh, but the leader is uh, Skelatea, the municipality from Sweden, near Northvolt, a city from uh, close to Northvolt, and Anders is Anders Norberg is our 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 leader. Uh, so we have uh, looked into the skills uh, and jobs and also how the, the technical part on how the batteries may evolve uh, the technologies how the technology will will evolve in in europe especially but also in the world so as you said uh, 800,000 jobs will eventually be needed in the future so these this uh, constitutes a very big challenge because these type of jobs, um, they, they are all sorts of, uh, they, they require all sorts of, of different skills because they, they would be from uh, uh, blue collar to white collar type of jobs. So these uh, type of jobs require different kinds of, of, of skills. And also uh, the, there is uh, uh, an, an extra problem because um, the companies also don't know how, how the technology is going to evolve. So they also don't know very well at this point what are the kind of jobs they need. So this, this puts a big, uh, 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 brings a, a very big challenge to us and uh, how are we going to tackle here in Europe the, the jobs, the, the skills. So what we have done in the first year is actually to analyze what type of, of jobs are, 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 are out there and, and eventually uh, analyzing how the technology is going to evolve, uh, eventually understand what is the base, the basic skills that we need in Europe, and also what are the skills that are going to have to adapt with time. So um, there are, there are uh, um, skills and knowledge that is needed as a basic grounds and and there will be some 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 particular challenges that will, will have to uh, to be addressed uh, um, for uh, uh, for special kind of, of jobs. So what we try is to to develop uh, course materials and 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 learning materials and and trying out new uh, uh, adaptive uh, uh, ways of, of teaching. But the problem that we have faced is, is that the companies themselves don't know what type of job they will be needing. So this is, and as you said, new companies are being created. And more, new, com new, new companies are, are, are being created for lithium-ion batteries, but we know that eventually lithium-ion is going to evolve to other types of technologies. For example, it is predicted that in the world, 30 new solid state companies will, 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 will be formed in 2021. So we need to, to be planning for the future, but the future is something that moves and we don't really know where it's going to, to lead us. So uh, as, as, a, as a personal conclusion, I think that we need to invest in the in the basics first because that's the ground towards uh, the the specialization first uh, uh, the 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 workers need to to know some basic skills that we need to figure out what what are those 
and and then um, we need to work on on more detailed skills. So I, I would think that this this is the approach, but the, the basic uh, um, ground is is something that I, I personally believe that is needed. A basic ground of of education that that constitutes the 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 infrastructure, the, the knowledge infrastructure for creating uh, in the future and, and for being up, for being, uh, um, for having uh, uh, ways of, of changing, because if we have a, a good, a good basic ground, we can change and we can adapt to, to new challenges. So that's, that's uh, that I would like to say for it. Okay, thank you very much, Elena. Uh, uh, I, I would like to bring in Frank on the, on the on the scene here because uh, uh, I know that uh, you have been working quite intensively with this question for a long time, and, and uh, lately what has happened is that uh, uh, the EU, EU Commission has actually taken some some uh, action on this and created something called the EBA Academy. Uh, which is actually going in to address this question. Can, can you please expand a little bit on that, Frank? Yes, yes, and uh, thank you, Johan. So continuing on, on Helena's um, uh, view on the skills, uh, we can say that well, 800,000 people to be trained in the next five years, it's a massive task. I mean, we have never done it before, and we will not get there by the traditional ways of working, which is uh, training just in case. And uh, so the EBA Academy, wants to take uh, the challenge of really scaling the training in very diverse areas in pace with the industry needs. For doing so, the European Commission has kind of uh, mandated in of energy to bring together all the partners that are on the education side in the different segments, whether it's higher education, technical training, vocational training, look at the best programs that we have already today or that we have to find somewhere that we have to build and then match that with industry in the most effective way so that we can really make it um, uh, possible that um, sorry um, that uh, a company that needs for instance a particular training they can address the EBA Academy and we will do the matchmaking and try to find the right program or the right courses or the right uh, way of skill development specifically for their needs. And for that, we will really leverage the power of the EBA network that already exists today, combined with the you know, energy network, so that we can uh, closely match industry needs with this. So um, this is the, the idea of the platform and where we are today, is really that uh, we have kicked off the activity not from scratch because uh, Inno Energy and partners have been working on this already for the last four years. So we have a, a pretty good idea on where some of those basic skills are, but uh, uh, certainly we are not complete. And we know that uh, combination of energy storage and digitalization is kind of the mix that is coming today. I mean, those are the two technologies that are the enablers of the energy transition, and that's where we want to focus on. So. Um, uh, we are now in the phase where we um, address the member states, where we want to connect with the training providers to see what they're offering today, where we are connecting with the industry players to really understand their needs. And if they don't know what they need, then we help them to think about it and really look for flexible skill development that is adaptable in time. But we are in this process, so certainly um, also what, uh, what Susanna was saying, we would be happy to, to speak to Gallup because this is a true private-public partnership, which will put skills at number one on the agenda and we will cover every aspect because to make this happen, I mean, we are changing literally everything in industry and to change everything, we need everybody from the manager to the floor worker, to the person installing and repairing. And this is our ambition, this is our scope. And I can tell you today that uh, giving the support that we get from EU, and what we already have available, we made um, a start, uh, well, hitting the ground running. And uh, I would invite everybody who wants to contribute, wants to learn more, to contact us. We'll be happy to uh, make this work because time is short and the number of people to be trained is massive. So we cannot waste another moment. 
Thank you, Frank. Uh, we have some questions from the audience, but first I'd like to, to <coughs> let uh, Miguel Portela in on, on, on the scene here. To, to, uh, uh, because I, I suspect that you have some comments on this when it comes to these uh, large transitions on the labor force in, in, uh, in such a quick time. So. Good morning to you all and thank you very much for the for the invitation. Just to, to provide some context for the Portuguese case for our discussion in Portugal, less than 1% of private firms invest or report investments in R&D. So, and this is an issue for, for the Portuguese case. At the same time, when we think about PhDs, which are a critical component of research, they comprise less than 0.3% of our labor force, which is less than 8,000 uh, PhDs in the in the labor markets. So there is substantial scope for improvement. But then there are two important things when we think about those 800,000 uh, workers that will be needed in this industry. On the one hand, we need to know it's not only the degree that they have, but it's important to know where they are in terms of economic activity and the type of training that, that they have. Uh, we might have a highly educated population, but with the wrong skills for the needs that we are discussing here. And again, in the Portuguese case, but this is rather common to other European countries, is that roughly half uh, of the, the PhDs that I was discussing about, uh, they are in small and medium-sized firms. So this might be a problem because the, the returns to those investments might be smaller in small firms than in larger firms. And at the same time, there are two critical issues for the Portuguese case, which is less than half percent of these uh, workers are in the most productive firms and really a small share are in uh, firms that are exporting. So again, when we think about the global value chains, just a, a small part of this human capital is being put at work for Portuguese firms that interact with worldwide uh, firms. It's very important to take into account for the STEM. So it's critical for sure within the discussion that we have and for this field, the STEM training. Of course, we don't need that all the workers are in STEM field, but like, again, it's only about 25% of the Portuguese graduates are in the STEM, in the STEM industry. So not only we have a relatively low level of education when compared to the European standards, but we also compare, we also have room to improve the, the type of uh, formal training, formal education that, that they have. Portugal is a, a major issue, which is, uh, which is common to other less uh, advanced economies in the European Union, is that it lacks uh, uh, middle skills. Like when we think about upper secondary education, we are really lagging behind uh, Europe. Like we, we have about 25% of the labor force as upper secondary education. And if you compare to the EU or OECD average, this is about more than 40%. And these middle skills, intermediate skills, will be fundamental for this number, for this figure of 800,000 workers. Uh, finally, when we think about training and reskilling, it's I would say that this is the major part of the, the investment because I would say that from what I learned about this topic is that we will have, we will need a major shift of workers that are currently in their middle life in terms of participation in, in the labor market and to reskill them to the skills needed in this uh, in this industry in this uh, uh, for the next decade. So this is very important at the European level that the reskilling investment it's a, it's a major issue. So in this case, just as a side note. Portugal is fortunately com uh, compared with the average European country, which is about 46% of workers reported to be in training or in education in the last uh, 12 months. But we need to improve this. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, uh, a quick conclusion on, on, on this uh, discussion when it comes to, to reskilling is that uh, the European value chain is truly European. Uh, and I'm seeing from uh, from experience with Northvolt and some other of these um, uh, major uh, gigafactories, there is an import of, uh, of labor force for, for all type of skills from, from all over Europe, but also from all over the world. So, 
So from this uh, mobility perspective in Europe, I think it's extremely, uh, uh, we have a very good uh, situation here if we can take a, a full, uh, the, take in the full picture here and use that. So. I, I, I think I'd like to, to use the, the, a few minutes uh, that's left here uh, and, and look at some of the questions that have come in from, um, uh, from the audience. And we have one, let me just have a look at that. Uh, first one that's directed towards uh, Susanna, uh, uh, which, um, where, which says, uh, you mentioned the partnership with Savannah Resources uh, that have raw materials. Are you also talking to battery manufacturers, which uh, with a view to completing the value chain? Are you still with us, Rosanna? There we go. So I'm saying that definitely. I think uh, from the first day that we started looking at this opportunity, we started looking at what will be the full value chain opportunity for Portugal and for Iberia. So that for us was fundamental. And I already mentioned that for us it's not okay that some critical skills go to certain parts of Europe and not to parts of Europe as Portugal. I have been living outside the Iberia Peninsula for the last 30 years. And I can tell you after coming back that the skill sets and the professionalism of the people here in Portugal are second to none. And I have been living in quite a few countries in my in my life. I also believe, Miguel, very strongly that people can be reskilled. We are doing it at CALC today. The amount of people that are joining uh, the renewable and new business on my side from other traditional sources. There are people very well skilled, very good engineers, very good managers, very good procurement people, and, and you can adapt those, uh, those skills to, to the market. So the answer is yes, we have been looking at raw material producers, not only in Portugal, but also around the world. We are uh, uh, touching bases, well, touching bases, no, actually in quite advanced discussions with refining experts around the world. We definitely are including cathode experts. And the major thing that we do in this case is to make sure that whoever is our partner is committed to invest into the full battery value chain here in Iberia. And we, of course, are talking as well to cathode producer, to, sorry, to, to battery assembling uh, company. So for us, it has been critical that whoever we partner with we put the full value chain here because we do not understand why we should only be doing mining and refining here and the rest of the skill sets in other parts of Europe. We have great ports, we have great facilities, and we have great talent to secure the full value chain for the Iberian Peninsula. Johan, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Oh, that's my fault. In our company, we have one euro if you're talking muted in meetings, so I'm getting poor <laughs> in this. So. Uh, I have another question here. Where do you believe, the, uh, and uh, this is a question that sort of uh, I tried to bring up earlier, but where do you believe that the Euro Europe stands regarding the future of batteries if we compare to United States or, or Asia? Perhaps I should direct this question to Christina uh, and see if, we, um, uh, if you have a, a lead on that in some way. Well, we, we are lagging behind in every respect towards Asia. I think I, I saw uh, that the 10 most uh, productive research institutions in the world, nine in batteries, nine come from China, and the one single one on the 10 top list is Argon National Lab in US. When it comes to volume, China is rocking. Something happened in 2012. We are still publishing a bibliometric study showing this. The same comes, of course, on the production side. They are, they are the producers of batteries today. When it comes to impact, we can see that US papers are still, scientific papers are still the most impactful, uh, have the highest in, impact. But China is coming up. Europe is quite good, but not at the same level. So, um, uh, yes, we, we have still a lot to do in Europe to catch up in every domain of this value chain, both industrialized and the education side and the research side. But we are, we are moving a slightly positive in the directions. This is based on a bibliometric study we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
there are still some questions coming in. Uh, and uh, uh, the next one here, there are two that are actually addressing the same thing here. Uh, uh, there's, sorry, uh, there's one that, that is actually looking at or asking about the, the big gap uh, between the, the, the urgency, the need for, for, uh, 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 for skilled workforce. And uh, uh, the, uh, when it comes to, to the entire battery value chain. And the, the question is really how can we overcome this and keep up with the high expectations of the European uh, community? So, and is there anyone that, that wants to, to raise the hand and, and take a stab at that question? Yeah, we have Frank that is uh, willing to, to say something about that. Yes, well, I think uh, to start with, I mean, this is uh, something we have seen in other innovative areas in Europe, where, for instance, in data science, there was a big uh, rush in getting people paid, but the industry is not ready, it still is not ready. But uh, I think the important thing is that uh, we create the awareness and make sure that uh, the programs are being built and that people are getting those basic skills, although the industry may not be ready to hire them today. And this is, of course, one of the uh, challenges we need to address in the EBA Academy because usually companies think ahead for the next six months to one year in terms of skills but here we need to think even longer and combine it with the existing um, projects. So our approach is certainly that we try to identify very early projects where those skills can be trained already and then scale it from there. And uh, having this lag between the supply and demand, I mean, it's not abnormal, but the uh, EBA Academy is certainly willing to address this by training just in time rather than just in case. And that's really what we want to do, this just in time training. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, Helena has raised her hand and wants to, to comment that as well. And uh, I believe that we are running out of time now. We started a little bit late, but uh, uh, we are closing in on the on the end time here yes as, as frank said uh, um it is it is a challenge and and uh, we need to reskill reskill is an important uh, an important part and and the knowledge the, the basic knowledge that that we uh, can uh, establish is is an important value in these in, in in our workers and and so we need to be focused on on skill on new skills and and on reskilling people that is working currently to prepare them to the future towards the future because in china everything happens so quickly and so it's it's we we need to to i think that is in the in the knowledge that we can make a difference in in how we we how our our workers are skilled and Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one final question, which I find quite interesting here, and it's uh, how do we convince young people uh, that the vocational education is part of the future? Uh, uh, do we have one, someone that, that wants to take a, a, a stab at that one? Otherwise, I can direct it to perhaps Miguel Portela here. So <clears throat> at the end of the day is a matter of incentives. So definitely the, the type of salaries that we are paying today to, to those intermediate skills are relatively low. So it's it's a it's a to some extent it's a question of improving the benefits to that investment. And at the same time providing a path for, for the career. So I think that, that would be one a possible way. Thank you. Thank you. I think that Christina Edstrom has her hand raised. Very quickly then, I, I do think young people already feel this, that this is an interesting area, that this is coming up hot. I think I see in a dramatic uh, change in interest to take courses related to this area. And I also see that the, uh, the, work go the things going on in Europe 
makes actually the educated people to stay in Europe. The dream is not any longer US, it's actually what's going on in Europe. I think we started this process. I just want to see that we don't, don't give up too early, that we actually have some long-term sustainability in our actions. I think that's important. Thank you. Uh, I would like to direct one question to, to uh, Miguel uh, from Volkswagen. Uh, uh, and the question is, do you see a, a challenge in, in getting uh, skilled people into your, your organization now? I mean, lots of challenge continuously. Yeah? So definitely with this huge uh, transition that the society is going through and uh, we as an OAM are going through, um, definitely a challenge, um, but a very realistic one, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I share the, uh, the vision of Gulp, that the workforce in Portugal is highly skilled, um, is highly motivated. And in, in, in our case, as a production facility in Portugal, um, actually, we don't have um, uh, the missing skills in the market. Actually, uh, we have enough uh, skills and, and uh, uh, we are always striving for more innovative ways to uh, uh, get people with us, at least uh, the ones who are interested. Uh, so definitely a challenge, definitely a big one. I would say very realistic, considering all the factors. Thank you very much, Miguel. Th this is the last thing we have time for at this uh, session. So I I'd like to thank you very, very much for taking part in this uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, discussion here. So, uh, and by that, I'm, I'm leaving the word back to, to uh, uh, INL uh, conference. Thank you to Johan Söderbom and all the participants at the last session of the INL Battery Summit. Just before the official closing, INL Director General now brings us the closing remarks regarding the main takeouts of this conference. Welcome again, Professor Lars Montelius. Thank you very much, George. So uh, I just would like to make a very, very quick summary. And I think when we think about what we have heard these two days and the discussions, I see that we have a fantastic possibility within Europe to take a technological leaderships in, I would say, five innovative areas. One being, for instance, in the green mining or the raw material extraction. I mean, we could make innovation there. So I see there is an innovation space, there are innovation possibilities there. The other one is in the materials that goes for the anodes, cathodes, electrolytes, new generation of batteries. We can take an innovation action there. We could be the market leaders. Uh, when it goes to the cell battery fac uh, fabrication manufacturing, yes, we have innovation possibilities with that also for machinery. We could develop new machineries with new integrated sensors or different kind of functionalities that will enhance the possibilities to make batteries. Maybe new form factors, maybe use the whole body, body car as a, as a battery, etc. So there are a lot of innovation possibilities. When it goes to recycling, for sure, there is a need to increase the recycling, and that has a lot of innovation possibilities. When it goes to the skills, for sure, there is a need, as we have been discussing, about new skills. We don't know, even know the jobs of the future. And here we have a possibility to do be very innovative. And I think the EBA Academy could pave the way for that, but it's more needed than that, right? We need to think about it in an innovation aspect, not only do more of the same, really invent, make new things. And then I would say the, so all these five areas has a lot of innovation potential where Europe could become a technology leader and have a technology leadership if we do the things together. And I think we're doing the right things together already with the different websites, with the different activities by the commission, and the strong support we're having from all the different governments, I think it's fantastic. And we have all, it's out there. We just need to grab it, but we need to do it together. And I think we are on a good way to do that. And then, as a final thing, it's not only about battery, of course. It is about the digitalization. It is part of electrification of society, which is strongly linked to the digitalization. So it's not battery 
as one thing and digitalization as another thing. It's a part of the digitalization. It's a part of the mobilization of, let's call it society, to become electrified. And this is where we have the challenges for tomorrow, but also the opportunities for Europe by being together. So I would like to say thank you to all of you that have participated in these sessions. It has been fantastic, very nice discussions, and thank you to all the all the different uh, people have been speaking and also the, the coordinators for uh, arranging the different panels. Thank you so much. And then I give the word back to you, George, for, for the final final. Thank you. Thank you to YNL Director General Lars Montelius, the host of the YNL Battery Summit that will now be officially closed by the Portuguese Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education, Minister Manuel Eitor, welcome. Thank you very much to everyone and to George and above all to YNL and Lars Montelius and his team for making this summit um, to happen. Above all, it's an European summit, summit and uh, we'll, we should look at Europe. And from an European point of view, I would like definitely to remember and to recall and to reaffirm what Lars just mentioned. We are not just speaking about batteries, but we are at large speaking about um, uh, strengthening Europe in terms of five major attributes, which actually have been decided to be those in place during the Portuguese presidency. First and foremost, to build a digital Europe. Second, a green Europe. And these two attributes, so-called twin digital and green transition, should be the drivers of most of our recovery plans in the coming, um, in the coming years, together with the idea to build a resilient Europe. And resilient means a strategic autonomy of Europe because, among many other issues, the pandemic crisis that we live on have shown certainly a measure of a major issues associated with the external dependence of Europe. And building up, building up capacity in the batteries together with facilitating the digital and ecological transition association in association with the electrification of mobility among others will be critical um, to build um, this strategic autonomy in Europe. But we know that these um, issues of digital green and resilience can only be achieved if we take into consideration the social context under which we live, and actually I really appreciate the, the statement Elena Braga mentioned about skilling, particularly in terms of reskilling, say the, the, the evolution of the, the, the skill gap in our uh, societies, but, but also together with a continuous triangulation between education, research and innovation, um, open up access to more and more uh, generations um, to higher and advanced education. So this pillar of social and social context under which education, research and innovation should be understood is particularly important because we need this to happen in a wide diversity um, um, regional settings, also including the Iberia Peninsula. Last but not least, the fifth pillar is the global pillar. Certainly, we need to produce batteries for Europe for our digital and green transition, but we need always to address global markets, to be competitive in global markets. Uh, and I, Christina, among others, address the issue of competitiveness in terms of um, China or the competition with American um, players. And certainly, we need to live more and more in a global competitive um, context under which Europe can and should lead this digital and green and green transition. So again, I recognize the importance of this. I listened very carefully uh, yesterday to uh, Commissioner Marus Sefodik, uh, uh, who to, with whom I've been discussing this issue quite intensively over the last months, to, together with Elisa Ferreira, the Commission for Social Cohesion. And again, apart from the specific contexts of the technology and the basic sciences associated with um, 
the evolution of batteries. We need also to understand this as a question of the energy resilience of Europe and certainly the social cohesion under which we need to understand um, Europe. That is the reason why it's so important that the Iberia Peninsula and Portugal and Spain together uh, launch this initiative, certainly in close articulation, but also in close competition with others in Europe. And Europe at large is very important to set up a number of uh, initiatives. And again, I recall the importance of the work Christina Edstrom has, in, has been done during the, the Battery Alliance to make sure that we can open up different initiatives in Europe. Actually, last February, when we launch Horizon Europe, Peter Wiesel from the Netherlands has presented a very interesting case of a, a, a startup, SAL, the Special Atomic Layer Deposition, which clearly shows the type of new stakeholders we have in this context. Certainly, we need the large car and automobile manufacturers or the large energy companies. But we have a new set of players, small um, startups, which in this case, in um, a new generation of atomic layer deposition for nanoparticles, which do need to build and to rely on an ecosystem that can only be provided through very competitive and excellent research and innovation institutions such as INL. And in this context of building up an European ecosystem, I particularly favor uh, and uh, support, and I'd like to emphasize what I have listened yesterday and earlier today about the need to center this activity in the industrialization of a new generation of um, um, solid um, state um, lithium cells. The idea that in Europe we will have a few um, large scale, large impact projects centered on um, a new generation of um, solid state lithium cells, particularly considering the matrix of energy density versus watt hour per kilogram, the challenge will be always how can we accomplish the demand for um, more intensive um, low weight batteries with the need to bring new science and new fundamentals of advanced materials together with um, the um, transformation and use of nanoparticles, including certainly processes such as atomic deposition of um, um, lithium particles, among, among others. But this issue to make sure that we cannot leave business as usual under the current status of cells and we need to evolve for a new generation of solid state um, um, cells, particularly in terms of maximizing um, the energy per unit volume. At the same time, we maximize the density of energy in, in the batteries. And this is a scientific challenge per se. Certainly, the question is how can we um, find the best compromise between the scientific challenge, which will require a comprehensive scientific investment uh, in new science, in nanoparticles, but also in the technology for atomic deposition, together with the financial sustainability of the electrification in markets. And certainly centering our attention on the development and industrialization of cell of advanced cell manufacturing will certainly create, I hope, new centralities in Europe and throughout Europe um, that certainly can be articulated, but also uh, find competitive arrangements which will all of us in Europe uh, will gain. It is in this context that I also see the development of a new um, recovery plan uh, considering uh, the basis on the INL activities, certainly with Portuguese 
Spanish companies, but also bringing other partners from the north and center of Europe should be articulated. Also, in the downstream, uh, in, the, in the necessary downstream activities, particularly in terms of um, the integration of uh, assembly and integration of batteries, as well as the recycling of uh, batteries. So we have certainly this, this, chain, this value chain towards the downstream, as well as we will have always a value chain in the upstream for particularly the extraction of raw and rare materials and the refinery of those materials. But again, I will center the activity on the advanced cell manufacturing and certainly making goods that it is combined in the downstream value chain with battery assembly and the recycling of batteries and in the upstream with the refinery um, particularly uh, of lithium and of extraction of lithium. In this particular case, we know how important it will be to move in the area of green mining and to make sure, including in the Iberia Peninsula, due to the, the position of um, lithium in the north of Portugal and along the Iberian Zeta, how important is definitely, again, to bring new science and new knowledge towards green mining and in a way that we can definitely show to the world how can we also extract um, micro quantities of lithium in terms of um, uh, the environmental preservation. But again, this can only be done if we, if we really at large in Europe are smart enough to find a better compromise of a new generation of solid state uh, lithium cells using less lithium, but having a better um, um, performance in terms of energy density and what our per kilogram uh, used. So I thank you, you all. As you know, certainly in Portugal, as in all European countries, this is very timely because these are projects which we need to consider definitely within our recovery plans. Certainly, the articulation between different countries with the Commission will be particularly important under the context of the next generation EU and, and therefore in close association with the, with the national recovery plans and the, the Portuguese recovery plan will consider certainly a major attention on building up um, an agenda for, on the electrification and the development of cell um, um, uh, um, uh, lithium, uh, solid state lithium, uh, uh, lithium cells, which needs certainly to be articulated with other in, in Europe. And this can only be done if we really are smart enough to build synergies among European funds. The recovery fund will be an important impulse, but the overall effort will go f far beyond the national recovery plans and they need to be articulated certainly with structural funding, um, um, particularly through um, FEDER, but also with our common approach in Horizon Europe. And it is certainly from the articulating of the different um, European centralized and decentralized funding with national funding and certainly engaging different stakeholders, public and private, and in particular um, private investment that we can move towards definitely a new generation of solid state cells with applications in the electrification of the mobility sector, but also with the downstream um, imposition of green mining uh, for the years to come. And this is an opportunity for Europe to lead the world to, so, to, to combine the digital and green transitions, certainly, again, in the development and centered and concentrated and derived by this overall challenge of developing a new generation of solid state cells together with green mining and certainly the sustainable use of um, the electrification of our mobility pattern. So I thank you all. I thank ENL for leading this, for, a, for a, attracting um, the business sector, the scientific sector, because this will be a unique challenge for certainly 
do demonstrate how collaborative arrangements between the demand for electrification and the supply of new scientific knowledge are the only way to develop our common future. Thank you very much. All. Thank you, Minister Manuel Itor, for your presence here today at INL Battery Summit, a conference that gathered so many diverse actors in this field with a common view. We need to act and we are already running late. Thank you also to Greenfest, the partner that enabled uh, the broadcasting of the INL Battery Summit. We hope that uh, you are leaving this event even more engaged and energized to be part of the future that Europe needs. Have a good day and thank you for being with us. Thank you.